Matchroom Radio, David Diamante, episode 70. We're here in Tijuana, Mexico with my good friend Gabe Rosado. King Gabe Rosado, it's great to see you, brother. Thanks, bro, good to see you. Yo, how you feeling, man? I feel good, man. When'd you get in? I got in uh, yesterday. Okay. Yeah, I flew flew in from LA to, to San Diego, but I was like, it was so, I might as well have just drove. <laughs> That's what I, I mean, well, I flew to San Diego and I drove. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I drove this morning. Oh, okay. I came in. Yeah, yeah. So now, you talk about LA, you've been there now 10 years, yeah? 10 years now, man. Yeah. That's crazy. It was just supposed to be a year. And you loving the West Coast vibes? I do, man, I do, man. I, you know, just the, the weather is great. You know, the networking and stuff, man. So it's home. It's a great life here on the West Coast. Yeah. For me, it doesn't work anymore because I travel so much in Europe. Sure. It's just not worth the extra hours to yeah, get yeah, over yeah. there. But I do miss the, the West Coast. I lived out here 11 years yeah. and I loved it. I love it, man. You know, see, we, we East Coast dudes, you, New York, Philly, it's hostile, man. <laughs> and the what? It's hostile, right? But <laughs> the West Coast is, like, is very different. Yeah, West Coast is way different, man. Yeah. And it's like, I love the edge of the East Coast, man. But you know, um, the West Coast, I feel like you just move a little more freely out, you know? There's palm trees, bro. <laughs> There's palm trees and There's sun. palm trees. Snow, snow. No I don't snow. miss that, bro. <laughs> See, I, I started to miss the seasons. I don't miss the door being jammed because it's like iced up in the morning. It happens, oh my you know, God, like, all the time. Yeah, man, it's crazy. I, with my motorcycle, I used to have to go and get boiling water and pour it into the keyhole because yeah. the, the, the ice would freeze in, my key wouldn't go in. I know, man, it's crazy. Yep, yeah, crazy. so anyway, that's great, so look, you and I, we always hang out. We always seem to hang out in Mexico. <laughs> and mm. we always smoke cigars in Mexico. I thought yeah. we were smoking today, but you're like, no, yeah, we're going to save that for later. Save it for later. <laughs> save it for later. But me, I'm, I'm going to smoke during the podcast. Sure. But, but yeah, I mean, we, we, uh, we always link up. We, we just saw each other in Monterrey. Yeah. And then in, obviously in Guadalajara a bunch. Um, and, and all over Mexico. No doubt. All over. Yeah, yeah. And you know, obviously you're Puerto Rican. And you're very proud of that. And obviously Puerto Rico and Mexico have this, this, this rivalry. I put it in quote, yeah, rivalry. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of love between the two. No, it is. But there's a lot of you know, rivalry because they both storied nationalities and, and both cultures love fighting. Mm -hmm. But in a way, it's almost like the Mexican fans have taken to you because of your heart and yeah. who you are. And, and like, if you look at your CV, it's bananas. You fought every, from, from 154, from 160 to 168, yeah. it's a who's who. It's crazy. It's, it's a, crazy a who's lineup. who. Yeah. It's a who's who. And I think the Mexican fans just like, they appreciate it just cause, you know, I just always put my heart into it. And then living in Los Angeles too, you know, it's predominantly, you know, Mexican. So, you know, that I just kind of won the fan base over, you know, and, um, you know, I got, I'm, I'm happy to just be a part of that rivalry when me and Mongia clashed in 2021, it was just, it was fight of the year. So, you know, that's just dope to be a part of that, right? Be a part of that history. Well, you're a part of a lot of history. Like I said, if we go back, I mean, I'm trying to, I can't even remember all the guys you fought, but yeah. like, we were just talking off camera, Saku Powell, you yeah. know, Kasim Uma. Yeah, uh, it's crazy, yeah, yeah, yeah. The David lineup. Lemieux, yeah. Triple G, Danny Jacobs, Kid Chocolate. Charlo. Charlo, Jermel Charlo. Yeah. He got a big fight coming up. Vera. Vera. Curtis Stevens. It, that was in the BKB, Kasim, right? Kasim Uma. Kasim Uma. Joshua Clady. You beat Clady. <laughs> I beat Uma Clady. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. My dude. It's crazy, man. It's a, it's a who's who. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then you, you obviously retired, which we're going to talk about in a sec. <laughs> retired. See, again, in quotes. But, but Beck the Bully. Yeah, Beck you the know, Bully. Um, Beck the Mimelikuziev, which was a crazy situation because obviously, you know, he's an Uzbek fighter. The Uzbeks have, have put so much into their boxing program, yeah. and it's really shown. It's there's re benefits yeah. with Shakram Giyasov and Murjan Akhmadaliev and, and skills, Israel yeah. Majumov and 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 their coaches and and the Diaz brothers. You know they're doing such great work, and they were really hype on on Beck the Bully, and 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 you starched him. Yeah, man, set him up. You set him up. He was. Uh, yeah. I knew. I, I, training for that fight, right? I knew he was going to land that shot, his money shot, which is that left. That, that big left to the body. And I just trained for it, man. He caught me with it. And I took that knee and I was like, okay. And I mean, I took that. So uh, it was just a matter of just setting him up, man. I knew, I knew he loved that shot. So I knew I could kind of, 
make it work against them. Yeah. And that was pretty much the game plan in that first fight. You know, there's so much that I want to talk to you about, Gabe. You, you, you're a really fascinating character in the sport. I hope people really appreciate you. Sure. Because you're, first of all, to me, you're like a throwback fighter. Yeah. You know, one of them cats that, that you're a real prize fighter. You, 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 you never, you, t you say yes. Yeah. And that's one of the things that's wrong with the sport today. You know, obviously I love boxing, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not shitting on our sport. Yeah, yeah. But you got to call it what it is. You got to keep it a buck. And when you see the talent in these divisions not facing each other, as a fan, forget working in the sport, as a fan, it's frustrating. Yeah. It's very frustrating. And if more fighters had that mentality that you have, I think the sport would be much better. Yeah, for sure. But I think it's just a matter of, I think it's a matter of the promoters you know um how so because it's you know if you got a guy that's uh on top rank and you got a guy that's on match room you know it's all about who's in charge of the of the event right the you know production I mean? it's a lot it's a lot of money involved you know i think what gave me like the um the advantage of just taking big fights was always because one thing fighters got to understand is is your performance you know of course you go into a fight with the mentality to win. But win, lose, or draw, if you put on a memorable performance, the fans want you back. Of course. You know what I'm saying? So. And I love that. You're 100% right. Yeah, so it's like if you think about it when it comes to guys like Roberto Duran. Many when you think losses. About, when you think about Roberto Duran, you think about Hall of Famer, legend. You don't think that he has 16 losses. That's in right. His record. You, I think people would be shocked. You know, they're not, you're you're not used to right. that, right? Um, so, man, I think, you know, Vander Holyfield, three-time heavyweight champion, he took losses, he always came back, but he was always an attraction because he was the real deal Holyfield. You know, people knew what they was getting, they was getting their money's worth, it's entertainment, right? So, man, I, I just think it's that, you know, the fighters have to have that mindset that when you go into a fight, you know, how you perform keeps your stock up, you know? If you stink up the show, because then you got guys at the same time that, you know, they, they, out for an example, like Rigadal, good fighter. Great fighter. Great fighter, never could draw the crowd Correct. because he would win fights, but it's not a pleasant style. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a fencing style. So really it just comes down to, you know, the, the, the level of performance, you know? Yeah, you, you're absolutely right about what you're saying. Yeah. Um, speaking of Holyfield, because I want to go back to the beginning a little bit and how you got into boxing and your North Philly background because yeah. you're from Philadelphia, a fighting city, wonderful city. Um, it's not New York, but yeah. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's a great, great city and, and uh, it's a fighting city. And yeah. you came up there and does, 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 they say that you started fighting in the streets at six years old, is this true? Yeah, you know, like, I, I, it's not that I started fighting in the streets, I was fighting in kindergarten. <laughs> I was fighting in the playground or whatever. But uh, over yeah, what? I, I remember like my first fight being, being in uh, in kindergarten, man. Matter of fact, I didn't. I don't know if I went to kindergarten. I think I went straight to first grade. Okay. Yeah. And um, yeah, I remember my first fight being like six, seven years old, man. Already a prodigy, skipping yeah. grades. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I don't know how that happened, man. But I know I did skip kindergarten. But um, um, so 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 you 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 a middle child. Yeah. You got two other siblings. Um, wonderful sisters, yeah. but, and you were fighting, but then something, you saw Holyfield Tyson won, and that, that sparked yeah. something in you. I remember, man, my neighbors had ordered it, and they, they invited us, and, um, you know, I grew up in, in a church, and I remember Vander Holyfield, you know, he was real into his religion, religion with God, right, and I remember Holyfield just coming in and um, just having like this aura about him, right? And then, you know, Tyson's just mean, you know, just right. walking in, no music, right. shirt off. And I'm just like, I'm a kid watching this. Like, it was just, it was so wild and crazy. And uh, when the fight happened, you know, the, the kind of performance that Holyfield put, you know, cause you know, Tyson was the favorite. And- um, Oh, I'll never forget that fight. Holyfield put like a, it was like a hero kind of performance. Cause he did the unthinkable. And I was just hooked. I was just hooked since then. You know, that fight, it, it was obviously, it's a, it, it goes down in the ages, right? But I love, there was something I loved about that fight. You know, Tyson, to me, 
he had so many of his opponents beat before they even got to the ring yeah. because they were scared. They were shaking in their shoes. Yeah. You know, when, when you saw Tyson, I mean, it was just, he was, and Holyfield was that guy that was just, you know, he's a boxer. Yeah. This is a boxing match. As much as it is violence and it's brutal and it's dangerous, it's a sport. And we're going to have a boxing match. And he wasn't shook by that. Yeah. And he knew to take Tyson into the deep waters and drown him. Yeah. And, you know, when I see certain guys like Triple G, like, like Triple G, you know, and like you talked about Curtis Stevens. I remember the, the build up for Triple G Curtis Stevens and Curtis mm -hmm. Stevens made like some mock grave and he was like, I'm gonna kill you and yeah, with the yeah, gang yeah. stuff and like talking all this. And Triple G was just like, you know, he looked like, you know, he had a cardigan yeah. and you know, he was just like, okay, you know, we'll put on a good drama show, whatever. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't worried about it because he knew what he could do in the, in the ring. And for someone like you that's faced all these guys, is that kind of that mentality? Like when you go in and people are like, like you faced, a, you, you basically faced a prime Triple G. Yeah, yeah, which yeah. Which I, sure. I want to talk about that too, but what's your mentality going into a fight like that? Are you, are you scared? Are you nervous? Or are you like, no, this is a boxing yeah. match. I'm capable in the ring, which of course you are, extremely. Mm -hmm. um, even though you have a ton of loss, it doesn't matter. You, you're very capable. You always show up well and you always fight like a warrior. Yeah. So how what's the mentality going into that man you know i was i was excited going into that fight i wasn't you know i didn't fear triple g at that time i was ranked number one at 54. um and i was just you know running through the opponents man at 54. you know i was the bigger guy knocking them out and you know the opportunity came to move up a weight class which you know i could look back at it now and i could be like i moved up prematurely okay I should have stood at 54, conquered yeah. that division, and then moved up. And because there's a there's a there's an art to matchmaking. There's oh. an art to how you move a fighter. Absolutely. Being young and being that that dog, you don't understand that that art. But there is. You have to know when to hold a fighter back. Um, you know. And at that time, I went and I fought Triple G, and I wanted the. You know, I wanted the. Uh, you know, just the fact that this was HBO, Madison Square Garden, it was everything I dreamed for, you know? But it was it was premature, but just that feeling of being there is like, all right, I belong here, you know, when I just kept doing my thing. But um, it was it was a great, it was a great experience. Do you think those experiences helped you or hurt you in your career? Man, I think a little bit of both. I think a little bit of both. I think, um, it's interesting, man, because, you know, boxing is life, man. Like, there's, like, this sport is literally how is, is, is life. You don't separate it. You know what I'm saying? It's um, how you behave in the ring. It's how you behave everywhere. If a dude's a punk, he's a punk. If a dude's um, a coward and if a dude shows a sign of cowardness in the ring, he's a coward. You know what I mean? Because the ring exposes you for who you are as a man. It's the ring of truth. The, is the, yeah, man, is when it's hot in there, when you cut, when, when, you, when you might have a broken rib, when that hand's broke. And, How do you react? And all you can rely on is your heart. Yep. You can't rely on nothing. You can't throw that, you can't throw that shot because You can go ahead and look broke. at the corner of your trainer, but he ain't going to help you. Exactly. It comes down to heart and will, right? So, man, you know, I had that in me, man, and I think that's what kept me in the sport so long. But uh, if you look at everyone I fought, and for me to be in the, be a professional fighter for 18 years is crazy, you know? And I think my heart kept me in it, man. But I think if I was moved differently, things would have played out different. How so? Well, I think, um, I think at 54, being ranked number one, my mandatory was canine. You know, no disrespect to Canaan, but Fundridge. You know, I just saw him. I saw him in Detroit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just I was, saw him in Detroit. I was tearing through the competition, man. You know, yeah, it's getting a little windy. A little windy, but that's okay. Yeah, I was tearing. I was tearing through the competition, man. And I think, you know, the smart thing to do was, you know, dominate the 54-pound division and gracefully move up, you know, at the right time. But I always found myself in a situation where it was like it was it was Golovkin. You know, and, and 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 from there it was just world class, world class, world class level fights. Yes, it was big fights. Um, you know, and and the truth is, man, there's fights where you get cut, man. And you know, there was a time where I was always getting cut because after after the Triple G fight, 
Um, Peter Quillen. That cut kept reopening. The Quillen fight. And I had to get uh, surgery to get it fixed, man. But I remember that really hurting my confidence going into fights where, like, damn, man, I hope the eye holds up. Yeah, right. You know, when your confidence who is, is your cut? Who was your cut man? My cut man, uh, Joey Eye at the time. Oh, I love Joey, yeah, Joey I. Shout I. out to Joey Eye. But the thing is, man, it just... Played himself in Creed, as yeah, did you, sure. as did myself. But yeah, we'll yeah, talk yeah. about that later. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. But it was just, you know... You know the the scar tissue was just bad. Yeah, and I, it was it reopened in the in the in the it reopened in the Peter Quillen fight. Yep. Charlo, oh uh, man, you name it. The the cut just kept reopening. I had to do surgery. I think I did surgery in 2016. What do they do for that? What kind of surgery? Well, what they did is they um, it was three scars. So what they do is they cut around it they and cut so around it and they, they yeah they, okay. they, they bring the tissue sure, in sure 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 okay. and they close it up and i think it's like 100 stitches underneath and 100 stitches over the top okay. to really suture yeah, it really, well yeah exactly um so yeah man that that, that really hurt my, my my confidence man going into fights because the eye was kind of <laughs> yeah for sure yeah. you know but but you know you learn from these things man and you know it's a you either going to fold or you just going to make an adjustment you know, when there's a lot of things that happen in the ring that, you know, um, it would just it just helped me be a better person, man. You know, you learn from the ring and you, you take things from life and you you impl you implement that in the ring. And then you learn something about yourself in the ring. And you implement that in life. You know, what I mean, so it's just a uh, hundred percent thing. Speaking of learning, I know you learned a lot from some of the greats and starting in Philly, Billy Briscoe. Yeah. Um, great guy. Yeah, Billy, man. Shout out to Billy Briscoe. Billy, man. Billy, a legend, man. Yeah, he's a great dude. And uh, I know I've been seeing his son on the gram doing, doing some things, too. But, um, but Jesse Reed also. Yeah, Jesse Reed. And Freddie Roach. Brother Nazim. Nazim Richardson. How did you hook up with Jesse Reed? I want to talk about that for Jesse me. Reed is when he, I moved. He trained some of the greats, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah man. Jesse's a legend. For sure, he a legend, man. It's when I moved to Los Angeles. Uh, there was a gym in Burbank that he was running. And at the time, you know, I just liked his style. You know, I knew who he was. And we just kind of, we vibed. And uh, we, did, we did two fights. How was it? Did you feel you learned? Yeah, lot? I learned from him. I learned from him, man. It was good. You know, I learned from all, all the trainers I had. I learned, you know, Billy, Billy Briscoe is, he taught me everything I know. He's a great, great trainer. Um, brother Nazim, uh, rest Fernando in, Vargas, big fan of Fernando rest, growing rest up. Rest in peace, brother Nazim. Yeah, me and Fernando Vargas, we beat, uh, yeah, rest in peace, brother Nazim. Me and uh, Vargas, we beat Joshua Cloudy together. Okay. We had about four fights together. Yeah. It was, it was good, man. Fernando, man. Fernando Vargas, man. He, he was the of, guy back in the day. He was one of my favorite fighters coming up. Well, another one of your favorite fighters, man, because, you know, you Puerto Rican, Tito. Yeah. We got to talk about Tito. Oh, yeah, Tito, Tito. Talk about Tito for a second. What does Tito mean mean to you? Yeah, Tito Trinidad. So we, we were talking about Holyfield and the Tyson fight, how that got me in. But then Tito Trinidad, he was, he was a Puerto Rican champion that made you feel proud to be Puerto Rican, man. It's the way he, the way he won, his, the way he was charismatic, the, the fans loved him, he was the people's champion. He really was. He was the people's champion, man, and he just had like that, he had that star effect, man, that Manny Pacquiao, that, that draw. Like humble. Exactly. But strong. Yeah, he was. A, he fought was, everybody. Fought everybody, knocked them out. Knocked them out. Yeah, so you know. He had that, he had that, he had that dead arm. And it's crazy Straight when I met him. When I met him in Puerto Rico last year, <laughs> it was the first time I met him. What was it like? And it's crazy because he's one of my idols coming up, and I walk up to him, and when he sees me, he's like, "Rosado!" Like he's like all excited. You know, right. he speaks Spanish on it. He's like, "Rosado, man!" Like I, I was, I was always looking forward to meeting you, and he was like excited to meet me, and I'm like, "This is crazy!" Like, you're like, Dude. no, you're my yeah. yeah. And uh, man, so it was, it was dope that when you meet, you know, one of the people that. You looked up to this. They're happy you. to meet you, so that that was dope. So okay, let me let me ask you something because this is so. An, I know another guy that that you real close with that dropped a lot of knowledge on you. Another Philly cat is B Hop. B Hop. But but 
But B Hop and Trinidad, see, I don't know, you know, fight fans, yeah. if you know anything about what's going on. I, I cry some, I cried when B Hop won. And, and it was tears and it wasn't tears of joy. <laughs> My dude. It wasn't tears of listen, joy. Listen, like being a New Yorker, yeah. it's so funny. When anytime B Hop would walk into the garden after that, it was just like Boo! I mean they yeah. hated him. They hated him, man. Yeah, man. They hated him, it, man. It was it was a hurt piece, man. It, it was, was a hurt it piece. It was a hurt piece when he won. <laughs> but it's crazy because then like Four years later, he becomes my mentor. Right. And uh, did you ever talk to him about that? Yeah, 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 yeah. I you told felt him, I some told type him. of way. Yeah, I told him. I told him. And what he, he laughed about it. He laughed. I'm sure he did. But you know, I'm he sure became. He, I'm sure he loved that. Yeah, for sure, man. He became my mentor though, and it's crazy because Bernard, he gave me a lot of gems, and it's it's interesting because it's like at the age, 37, right? I'm starting to understand things he told me when I was 19. It's, it's making sense. When I was 20, when I was 22. Right. When I was coming up, right? But he say certain things where it just didn't hit. I look back at it now and I'm like, oh, I see what he meant. That makes sense. So, you know, he taught me a lot of stuff, man. So shout out to B-Hop, man, you're a legend. Shout out to B-Hop. And, and speaking of Tito and speaking of the garden, when Tito fought at the garden, it was just unbelievable. Um, the atmosphere was crazy. I don't think I don't think no one could do that. Yeah, I mean, Cotto, what, T, what Tito I, what Tito did at the Garden was like how people responded to like Duran. Yeah, it was it was a special special thing. It was, yeah, it's a different yeah, it was a different vibe. And then when he fought um, what's the dude's name from Nicaragua? Um, oh, uh, Mayorga. Mayorga. Oh, I was at that fight, and Mayorga. You know, he's famous for like giving you his yeah. chin. But you don't do that to Tito. Uh, like, you, you can't do that to Tito. Tito he took him it. Down. He broke him down. And, and Tito, oh, Tito, knocked Tito him had out. came back, like. Knocked him out. It, he was on a two-year layoff. So it was like, what kind of Tito are we going to see? He's right. been out for two years. And it was like, he ain't even lose a beat. <laughs> he ain't even lose a beat. He threw, like, about 100 punches around. He, yeah. killed, he killed Mayurga. What do you think about the De La Hoya Trinidad fight? The De La Hoya Trinidad fight? So like, who do you think time, who you think won the fight? At the time when I saw it live, I thought Oscar won. When I look back at that fight now, put that fight on mute. Put it on mute. Don't don't listen to the commentators. Just, I love the commentators. I think it was uh, I think it was, uh, Lampley it was Larry Merchant, Lampley, Lampley, and uh, I think it was um, Foreman, George Foreman. Yeah. I don't remember who, I, I, it was HBO, I can't remember who it was. But what I, th I think Oscar had a great game plan. And I think Oscar was looking really good when he was boxing. But I think um, those last four rounds, he just gave, gave him up. He just gave him up. And there was a couple rounds in the beginning part, the first half of the fight, the where swing. could have went either way. But you literally gave up those last four rounds. You, you, cause you, you, you completely changed. Yep. You went from fighting and boxing and throwing these combinations Beautiful. and punches and punches but, yeah. to you got where it was almost looked like you were on survival mode. It yep. looked like a, a fighter that was hurt and it was just trying to get away. Yes. You know, you can't win a fight of that magnitude right. like that. So I ain't mad at the decision. Right. You right. know, I feel like that was on Oscar. He gave that away. Right, right. It's very interesting. Did you see the, 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 the documentary? Yeah, I did. I did. It was crazy. I thought it was good. It was I thought crazy, they did yeah. a very good job. Yeah, man. Very interesting. But yeah, great times and in shout, Boston. Shout out to Oscar, man, for you know, uh, you know, adapting, man, and not letting those, not letting things, you know, uh, bring them down. A lot of people don't come back from. Yeah, I mean, from that, man. Look, so you could say where he's at now, man. Is, you know, he's a champion in the ring and he's a champion in life. Well, I'll say this, man. I don't care what anyone says about Oscar. In the ring, that dude was unbelievable. Yeah, man. He was unreal. And he Stop. fought everybody. Yeah, he fought everybody. He was incredible, man. Yeah, he was. You know, my yeah. favorite fighter is always Sugar Ray Leonard, right? Yeah. But Oscar De La Hoya, watching him fight was just unbelievable because he had a lot of the same attributes. He yeah. could box. He could slug. He was just real tough, man. He was really smart. Super hand speed, super footwork. Had a good chin. Great chin. Took a, took a good Great punch. heart. I mean, just an incredible fighter. Yeah, for sure. Really, really incredible fighter. And, um, you know, knowing Oscar and, and having worked with Oscar and, and being able to see that, I think it was really great. I think it's great for the fans. I love when these pieces come out. You know, yeah. maybe there'll be one about you. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. You never man. know. So, so, so is the story over in the ring? Yeah, man, I think so, man. You well, know, hold on. I, I, a, I, I, I seen a tweet just the <laughs> other day. What, what, cause, cause speaking of Puerto Rican fighters, uh, we all know about um, uh, Edgar Berlanga. But I yeah. seen you tweeting about him the other day. What was going on with that? You know, man, it's, I, know, I know Edgar. I sparred him in Puerto Rico. Uh, I think it was like two fights back uh, that he had. He, he started a camp. Now I met up with him. I sparred him. Um, and you know we were we were cool, we were cool, we were in good terms or whatever. And then um, you know, I think I voiced an opinion about him, but I was just voicing an opinion about him like, you know, I'm I'm commentating. And you're so doing part, a great job, by the way. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. So part of you know it's my job to critique fighters and give my expert opinion. And I just said some things. I ain't, I ain't no dis nothing disrespectful. But I think he took some kind of way and he unfollowed me. <laughs> oh, okay. So I was like, oh, you know what I mean? So it's like, you know, we were chilling in PR, cool, whatever, whatever, sparred him, and then all of a sudden he unfollowed me. So I'm like, okay, I guess he's feeling some type of way. And I just, you know, I said what I said, you know, because I think he's in a position that, I think he's in a position that he's not taking advantage of, you know? And um, he, he showed it in his last performances. You know, he was knocking everybody out. And then the moment he steps up in competition, you know, he biting people or he's like, you know, changing his whole style. And it's like, you know, he ain't behaving like a fighter. And uh, me coming up how I came up and having to earn my spot and having to really, you know, like I didn't have the big team behind me. You know what I'm saying? And he has that right there where all he has to do is put in the work. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying he's not putting in the work, but it's like, you know, as a fighter, I see certain behaviors. And I was just, I was just, and I told him in person certain things I felt he should have worked on. And he took it some kind of way and that was that. But I just didn't know if he called you out or if there's some type of smoke. Well, or... he was calling me out before. Before we ever met in person, he would okay. call me out. Okay. He would say, I want a shot at Rosado, you want to fight Rosado, whatever, whatever. At the time, I was looking at it like, who is this kid? Because he was coming up, and I had just fought Daniel Jacobs, you know, in which, you know, I beat Danny. And then uh, I knocked out uh, Beck Demir and, you know, the big fight with Munguia. So when he's calling me out, I'm like, bro, I'm like fighting big fights right now. Like, you know, he, was on, he was on the come up. Right. And um, we met in PR, sparred him, whatever, whatever. And then when I threw a shot at him, which wasn't even a shot like I'm beefing, like I don't like you. It was just like, bro, I think it would be a dope fight. Right. He felt some type of way. And I was like, bro, we, we in a sport of, of fighting. This is what we do. And you I, fought friends before. I fought friends. I fought a bunch of friends. Yeah. Yeah, I fought a bunch of friends. Some of my biggest some of my biggest wars were against friends. I mean, it's just a business. It's a business. It's money. Again, you're a prize day, fighter. You are a prize yeah, fighter. And at the end of the day, right, if you and your friend, you know, yeah, y'all, you know, y'all going in and y'all trying to take each other's head off, right, but at the end of the day, y'all feeding each other's family. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, Straight up. That's how, that's how I look at it. I'd rather break bread with a homie than right. some dude I really don't like. Right. Right, so, so yeah, when I called the model, it was like he took us some kind of way. But, um, you know, it is Speaking of, that reminds me of the, the beef that was going on with you and Danny Jacobs back in the day. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a bunch of words. Where was that, in Texas? We were in Texas that or something. Was in, I can't uh, remember. I don't remember where it was. I feel like it was in Texas, but I might be wrong. There's yeah. been so many fights. Yeah, I don't but remember I remember that. It was. it was like... Yeah, we really ain't like each other, though. <laughs> yeah, but still? Yeah, that was real. Is it still? Do you still? You know, I, I mean, I don't feel no type of weight towards them. You know, I, I, you I know, haven't I, seen Danny in I a feel, while. I do, I do feel like, damn, like... You know, they, they, they robbed me of a win, you know, of a, of a good boxing performance. But it is what it is, man. You know, sometimes you got to deal with the politics. Well, let's say you don't fight Berlanga. Would you ever, not saying that he wants this, but would you ever be interested to maybe train him? You know, yeah. Because, not that he's asked. I'm not, but I'm just. <laughs> no, yeah. Because, because again, like, you, you, the coaching tree comes down. And we just talked about some of these guys from, from Billy to Jesse to, to Nazim, to, to Fernando, to, to Freddie. I mean, you've trained with some of the greats and, and you've been in the ring with a lot of greats. Yeah. Um, so you have a lot of knowledge and anyone that's listening to you on the mic commentating, you know what you're talking about in boxing. Yeah. 
So you have, and, and for people out there, because we're going to talk about this life after boxing, you, you have a gym in Los Angeles yeah, yeah. that people don't know. So you are training people and stuff like that. So the coaching tree, there's a lot that comes through you. Yeah. You know, and B Hop, another one. Oh, you know, a sure. lot of people drop knowledge on you, you and you a sponge. You, a, sure. you you about the game. For you sure. always been about the game. Yeah, yeah. Anyone that knows you. So you take it very seriously. You love to have fun, it's a great time. Oh, I always have a blast with you. Yeah, yeah. But you a boxing cat. Yeah, yeah. And I love that, so I just respect you for that. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, so but but it I, it seems like you have a lot to give to some young fighters. Yeah. I don't know, maybe you're not a, maybe you're a terrible trainer. I don't know, but I don't <laughs> think so. No, I th- man, I think you'll be I, good. I, I would like to help fighters out. You know, I would like to help fighters out. You know, I think the most important quality of of training is is being a teacher. Yeah. See, I think nowadays what you have in boxing is you got more trainers than you got teachers. Right. You know, Costa Mato was a good trainer because he he was a teacher. He he taught you how to how to behave. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't just about showing you how to throw a jab. It wasn't Correct. just about showing you how to how to um, your fundamentals, footwork. It was mentally being able to control you. Yeah. You know, Mike Tyson was scared to fight. You know what I'm saying? But he was able to he was able to channel that fear and use it for Mike. If it wasn't for Custom Auto, we would never hear about Mike Tyson. Uh, it took a it took 100%. a teacher to understand exactly the mind of Tyson. And that's why we have Mike Tyson. You know, and I think And Kevin Rooney. Kevin and Rooney. Teddy Atlas. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, you know, um, and they come and they come from the lineage of of Cuss. Correct. Right? So and I think that's what it really comes down to. You know, you have trainers, um, um, you have trainers that they're just teachers, man, the old school trainers. And I think that's what fighters are missing. It's just, you know, being able to like under not every fighter is the same. Yes. Some fighters are wild, some fighters are calm. So you can't train this guy how you train this guy. 100%. It's a different mindset. You know what I'm saying? So I think that quality is lost. Not in all trainers, but in most trainers is lost. It's just understanding a fighter mentally and what's going to get that fighter going. And what, what do you say to that fighter in the corner that could change everything? Because a lot of times fights are Big fights were won. Remember when... Um, Angela Dundee told Sugar, uh, to Sugar Ray Leonard, you're blowing it, kid, you're blowing it. He knew what to he say. He knew exactly what to tell him. He knew what to say. Right? He knew exactly. He, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't say, this is what you got to do. Drop the right he, and, and, he, and pick, break the Sugar Ray knew what to do. Yeah. But he needed to, to know, he needed to turn he just, on that. Yep. He just he needed to light, hear, hear light that say, flame under the yep, ass. You're blowing it, kid. You're yep, blowing it. Yep. And he responded. Correct. Because he knew how his fighter would behave he if he his, said that. He knew his fighter. Teddy Atlas did it all the time. All the time. You know what I mean? Teddy Atlas even called someone on the phone one time in the middle of a fight. <laughs> he called somebody, who he called somebody, wife or something? I don't know. He called somebody. Teddy's called me on the phone. <laughs> no, but in the corner. My, in the I, corner. Remember in the corner. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, you know, Teddy, Teddy, Teddy's one of those trainers. He knows what to tell his fighter in the corner. And, and Teddy keeps it real. Yeah. And he knows the sport. Whether you agree with everything Teddy says or not, or, or you like his style or not, he knows the sport. Yeah. You know, I miss important. hearing Teddy on the mic. Yeah. I really miss hearing and Teddy on no, the mic. Man, there's nothing better than to when you're in a fight and your trainer tells you exactly what you need to hear. That's it. Because sometimes, bro, your trainer might be saying, all right, double the, double the jab. And, and, and he might be saying what was technically sound and was right. Yeah, but it's not. But it ain't, it ain't hitting. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's like this. Like they say, they say when you're arguing with someone, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Or exactly. It's not what you say, it's how they receive it. Exactly. It's exactly what you're saying and exactly. knowing the person that you're talking to. I'll give, you, I'll give you one more. Tito Trinidad's dad. Yeah. When, Ch- when Trinidad would mess up, he'd come back to the corner, his dad would slap him. Remember that? Yes. Like, not no little, not no little, wake up. It was like, bat. Slap him. <laughs> he smacked the shit out of Tito. But and Tito knew. would come back the next round he and destroy to, the and guy. Destroy. Yeah, he knew, he knew how to get it out of him. Yeah. And just like you're saying, you know, you don't make love to women, to, to, to every woman the same way, right? You don't exactly. play a sax the way you play a drum. Yeah. Or, you know, and, and every fighter and trainer, there's a different dynamic. It's a different dynamic. And, and I've said the same thing to people about Mike Tyson, and that's what makes those guys so great. They knew, they had a guy with the physical attributes and he had the angst in him, he had the fighter in him, but he was just a raw mineral yeah. and they had to chisel him down to get that beautiful diamond, exactly. which they did, For sure. but it took a lot of work and took years yeah. and it took understanding what they had. Exactly. So you feel like you have that type of thing to give to other fighters. Yeah, because I, I, under, I understand the mindset of things, man. You know, men's, 
boxing is so like the mental aspect of it is so important you know so important like the mental aspect of it is you know 80 percent of the of the fight yeah you know so it's just it's just locking in yeah mentally we got a good fight this weekend um angel fierro tashiro what do you think of him you like him i like him a lot man yeah. i like him a lot you know he's um he's ferocious you know he's gonna walk you down he's throwing punches and bunches he's a big puncher yeah you know um this performance the kind of performance he puts on is going to solidify whether he's ready for that big step. Yeah. And, um, you know, he doesn't have a perfect record, but who cares? Doesn't matter. He definitely is a different fighter. And I think he has a great opportunity to show that he's ready for, like, the big dogs at 35. Yeah, it's a great division, and he is really exciting to watch. Um, we're in his hometown. You know, he trains with uh, Zona Norte. And he's, he is ferocious. And he's a nice kid, man. Yeah, he really sure. is a nice dude, but he's ferocious in the ring. Really exciting to watch. He has good, he has good speed, too. Yeah. Good speed, good movement. He, he's fun to watch. He really is. He's fun to watch. He's an entertaining fighter. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to the fight this weekend. So, look, we got some fan questions. Are you, are you okay to For answer sure. a couple fan yeah, questions? no doubt, no doubt. Let me go see what, see what these are here. All right. Here. Okay. Jason Ski Sample asks, did you ever get caught up in the politics of boxing at the back end of your career? Close defeats to Murray. Oh, yeah, you fought Martin Murray. That's another guy. Another guy you I beat fought. beat Murray, bro. You did, but, but you I fought beat Martin Murray. Murray. Bro. Shout out to Martin Murray. Yeah, shout out to um, Martin Murray, but I beat he, him. He said, close defeats to Murray, Jacobs, and the draw with Arias. Flipped around the other way, and your career would have accelerated at the back end. You know, I think uh, it's... It's interesting, man. You know, honestly, I wouldn't change anything because I think I think the way it played out molds me for whatever the next chapter is. That's just how I look at it, man. You just can't look back at the past and be like, damn, no, this no, would have happened. Of course. Well, this would have happened. Yeah. I think it's just you got to look at it. Like one thing you can't change is the past, but you're in control of the future. Yeah. So you just got to kind of like have a perspective of what happened and how can you use that experience moving forward. Correct. So that's just how I look at it, man. Yeah. For sure. Okay, Lori Withers asks, you box some bad MFs. That's true. <laughs> One punch power, who hit the hardest? You know, it's, it's, it's a great question, by the way. It's interesting because I know people want me to say a big name, but there's fights where, there's fights that like I had in like, uh, Telemundo, <laughs> right, right. when I was coming up, right. while I fought dudes, I was like, dang, I remember I fought this one guy, his last name was Soto. It wasn't Karaz. I was going to say you fought Jesus Soto yeah, Karaz. I, I fought, yeah, it wasn't Karaz, but I forget it. I remember his last name was Soto. Um, I remember he punched me in the 10th round, and the back of my head went numb, and I felt like a bunch of, like, a tingling sensation, like needles, like a bunch, and it was crazy, man. I had to kind of just keep circling the ring until the round was over. Where did he hit you? He caught me clean, bro, but, but it was like, like straight, straight on the face. Yeah, clean shot. I didn't buck. I didn't. I didn't stumble. But, but you felt it. The back of my head just, the punches, the punches you feel, like those kind of punches, like the punch you don't feel. That's the dangerous one. Right. That's you sleeping. Yeah, you sleeping. <laughs> the one you don't feel is the one that gets you. Yeah, that's true. But it's like uh, it's like Holyfield said, if you in the pain, if you feel the pain, you in the game. That's it. So you know. But he <laughs> caught me with that shot. And I was like, shit. <laughs> But you know, what about I'll like give Lemieux? You, I'll give you because okay. I always thought Lemieux, See, Lemieux. Lemieux was one of those guys that, like, if you stood in front of me and knocked you straight out. Lemieux was a big puncher, big puncher. But I was able to adapt to his punching power because everything was hard. He threw fastballs all day. Correct. So you know he didn't have no switch up. So after, as the fight went on, I was able to, I was able to just time it. You timed it. Even though in that fight I had to detach right in the third round. So I was fighting blind in that fight, which is crazy. But uh, Peter Quillen had heavy hands. He was heavy handed. Good chocolate. Yeah, Peter Quillen was heavy handed. I, I know people would think Golovkin, but Golovkin wasn't, it wasn't even that it was power. Well, Golovkin, it was, it was, it was that per precise timing. The do, 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 tap and tap and tap and tap and tap and tap and tap, bat. Where was like, oh, where'd that come from? Right. It was just no. He, he he had that ability to switch speeds where you know he'll kind of like throw a shot over and and lure you to sleep with these little pitter patter shots and then boom, he was sharp. He was a sharpshooter. Set you up for stuff. Yeah, it was it was those you know those quick shots. 
It's like in baseball, man. Yeah, baseball, exactly. You know, pitcher has a fastball, a slider. Change up. Change up. You know, before you know it, that fastball, boom. Boom. Yeah, exactly. That's the knockout joint. Yeah, yeah. It's incredible. I love that. Yeah, yeah. It's one of the things that makes the game so exciting. If you understand it, mm-hmm. the nuances of the game is wonderful. We've talked about that before, how, and this is one of the things why I think you make such a great trainer is because you, it's, it is those little nuances. It's not about throwing power punches every time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You it's know, switching it up. Switching it's, it's, it up. It's, the, it's science, man. Yeah. It's the craft. And there's so many different types of a jab or of a hook or of, there's just so many types of punches exactly. and they all serve different purposes yeah. at, for different times. For sure. If you think about it, right, any fighter that was coming up that was blowing through the competition and was a, a pure power puncher but showed his power, just came at you intentionally to knock you out and every shot was hard. Whenever they faced that, that different level of competition, it never worked out. Right. Because the skill of being able to switch up speeds is what keeps you in the game longer. You know what I mean? Sweet science. It's the sweet science. If all you got is a fastball to your arsenal, it's like you ain't going to, once you reach that high level, it, it changes. But it's it like, switches. that's why you put Mario on a Rivera in at the end of the ninth inning, you know, in the ninth inning, yeah, yeah. you don't put him in at the beginning for the whole game because muff- yeah. people will start, <laughs> sorry, people will start timing him. Yeah. They'll start timing him. They'll yeah. see you. Yeah, they'll yeah. see you and they'll start hitting you. For sure. But, you know, you only see him for a few, for a few pitches, he gets you out of there. Yep, for sure. But uh, um, fights aren't always four rounds. Yeah, yeah. You know, when you get to that level, they're 10 and 12. Exactly. Especially the ones that you fight. Yeah. All right, let's see. At the dog and bone man asks, there's so much being talked about in the sport about drugs testing at the minute. How rife do you think is it is at the minute? Is it's a worrying time from a fan's perspective. So what what is he asking about? I don't know. I don't really <laughs> see the question here, but at the at the dog and bone man asks, quote, there's so much being talked in the sport about drugs testing at the minute. How rife do you how rife do you think it is at the minute? I guess Drugs. About the drug testing? Yeah, or drugs. Is it a worry? He says it's a worrying time from a fan's perspective. Yeah, man. I think, uh, you know, I think boxing definitely has to get more stricter with with, uh, drug testing and keep it an even playing field. But I think there's, I think there's things that do benefit a fighter that, you know, things like, uh, you know, cryo, there's certain scientific things you can do that's not gonna, you know, that's not steroids. Right. I think when you're using something like flat out like steroids, man, you know, I think that's, uh, I think that's when you draw the line, you know, but um, there's different ways to improve your, your strength, your skill scientifically, you know, um, and I'm for that because it's a sport where you have to take care of your body. You know what I'm saying? It's a sport where you have to stay healthy and and there's a sport where you have to keep your mind sharp, man. You got to stay crisp. But as far as steroids and things like that, man, I think, you know, boxing should definitely get stricter on that. Do, do you think, but I guess to his question, it seems rife with, with it. Do you think there's a lot of people doing it or you don't know? You know, man, who knows? Honestly, it's something that's not talked about in boxing. Like we don't, you know, you don't go to the locker room and the fighter's like, hey, man, I'm, I'm on this. Woo-woo. Right, 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 like, right. Nobody talks about it, bro. Right. And, um, you know, I'm not educated on it. I really don't, I really don't even know the effects of what it does for you. Yeah. You know, uh, so I'm not educated on it. I really don't know. But I'm, I was always the fighter where I've never put nothing in my body. If I didn't know what the hell it was, yeah. if I couldn't pronounce the word, I'm not putting it in my body, yeah. bro. You know, if it's something crazy, it's like, okay, I'm good. You know, because I, I care about my health. You can be, you can be on something that in the moment, is going to make you a better fighter or whatever, whatever, but can kill you in the long run. It's about the long game. Yeah, it's the long game, man. You know, this is this is just now. It's the long it's a, game. Yeah, it is a, it's a young man's sport. The real players know that. <laughs> it's a young man's sport. You you got 10 years plus, you're lucky. Not too many guys can say they've been in the sport for 10 years. Like, you're very lucky to have a 10-year career. Absolutely. Anything past that is a blessing. And you're 17 plus. 18. 18. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's a minute. Yeah. It's a minute. Did you ever any, have any jobs before boxing? Yeah. What, what was your jobs? What before was your, boxing? Yeah. <laughs> what was your jobs? Bro, I was always grinding, bro. Doing I, what? Doing what? Uh, <laughs> graveyard shift at Home Depot. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
working for the water company, putting water mains underground. Yeah, I had dirty, rugged jobs, 10 hour shifts, tired as hell, I had to go to the gym. What and else, I, what else did you do? Yeah, I did. Uh, I worked at the Eagle Stadium, Lincoln Financial Field, okay. doing power wash when, you know, when the fans the wrecked e the stadium. The you know, Eagle Stadium, the stadium, by the way, if y'all think, think the black hole in, in the Raiders Stadium is yeah. bad, go, 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 to the, go to Eagles. I always had a job. I always had a job. I think my last job was 2011, and it's when I got my break on NBC Sports. Okay. And I beat that year is when I beat uh, Soda Karaz, Kasin Uma, and Charles Whitaker. Yeah. And uh, you I fought got, Derek Ennis too. Yeah. So I literally ranked number one in the world with a job, with mm. a graveyard shift at Home Depot. Mm. <laughs> so I get off my shift at like six in the morning. I bang my run, go to sleep, get up, go to the gym, train, and from there shower up and go straight to work. And I ranked number one in the world having a having a graveyard shift. And then I quit. Were you, which promoter, I, <laughs> were you, when you got the Triple G fight, were you with a, were you signed with someone? No, I wasn't. I was, um, I had Russell Peltz as an advisor. Oh, Russell was, okay. And uh, the run that I had at 54 was under main events. Main events had that TV deal with uh, NBC Sports. Yeah, sure. So it's crazy because I wish I would have signed with uh, main events at the time. Well, I mean, they main were, events they, was... They were doing a great job the moving. The Duvas, the Duvas. Kathy were, was super dope working with. Yeah. So Jalen. Yeah. Super dope. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And man. Russell Pell, it's funny. Looking at your, your CV, you know, your, the list of fighters you fought, it makes sense that you were Russell. Yeah, yeah, Russell's yeah. a throwback, man. Know, man. He's one of those guys, he'd throw you in. For sure. He'd throw you in, you know. For sure, man. He's so a guy good. that loves the sport, Hall yeah. of Famer. Definitely, man. He's a, he's a boxing encyclopedia, man. He, knows he that, really man. is. Yeah, for sure. Love Russell Peltz. Yeah, yeah. Shout out to Russell. Um, you know, another question I had, just because we talk about those three weight classes from 54 to 68, where did you feel most comfortable? Was it 60? Was it 68? Was it 54? Where did you? Well, I felt comfortable, you know, at 54, um, I was dominating opponents at that weight. I, I moved prematurely too soon to 160. So it took me a while to fill in and get comfortable at that weight, but I still held it down because, you know, good performance against uh, Quillen, who the fight got stopped on a cut, but I was, I was winning the fight. Yeah, that was it. That was, I, I remember that yeah, fight very well. I was winning the well. fight, and it got stopped in the 10th round with the cut, which, yeah. you know, it was, it was horrible because the cut wasn't bothering me. Was Joey in your corner as a cut man? Yeah. And then... Uh, yeah, so I filled in. I filled in pretty good as I had a couple fights at 60, but I felt good at 54. Eventually, I felt good at 60. And then um, in the 68, I had some pretty good wins. So you felt good at all of them, really? Yeah, yeah, just yeah. Just took a little time. Yeah, just, just the, one, the, the, the one fight at the first couple fights at 60, I just had to, like, grow into it, you know? And when I, when I speaking of Joey and, and, and you and Philly and, and Rocky, playing yourself in Creed, yeah. or not, you know, playing, playing yeah. in Creed, the film Creed. How, what was that like? That must have been a thrill. No, it was crazy, man. It was dope because it was in Philly, uh, my home city that we shot it in. And just, you know, being part of the, the movies, man, and being part of that event, going to the red carpet, the premiere, and it's like being with uh, Stallone, who, you know, he's a, he's, a, he's a hero in Philly with the Rocky movie. It was just crazy. And the fact that he's like, it's funny because chilling with Stallone is like, you're actually chilling with a fighter because he really knows the sport. Yeah, he does. So he loves talking boxing. He's a big fan of the sport. And it was dope, man. It it's was amazing. A, it was, a, I'm glad I did it, man. I, I moved to LA to get into the scene because um, they told me that I should have got, uh, they called me and asked me to get into the films. So I moved out there in like my first four months of living in LA, I get a shot at, at, at the movie Creed. So it's, it was kind of crazy how I played out, moved to LA, go back to Philly four months later. And, then, and, for, and being a film. Yeah, it's wild. That is funny. Yeah. And speaking of like, you know, life outside of the ring, you, you're looking to do a podcast now. Yeah, for sure, man. Tell, tell us about I'm, that. I'm working on it, man. I definitely want to, uh, I just want to talk about the sport, you know, and just give my insight on it. And, you know, just, probably, just give my opinion on what I, what I see in the sport. You know, I love the sport. I love boxing. And it's, it's a way for me to stay, be a part of it, and just mm. do what I love. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you put something out on Instagram the other day. It was a quote. It said something like, 
Life without discipline is chaos. Yeah. What is what do you what do you mean by that? Man, it is, man. Without discipline is like, you know, I think it's really easy to get caught up with like pleasures in the moment. Yeah. And you know, I think if you look at the long the long run, you know, you have to sacrifice things in the moment for how how you set and plan your future out. But if you always if you're always trying to pleasure, you know, if you're always looking for that that hit in the moment, you know that, you know, you set yourself up for failure in the, in the, in the, in the long run, man. You know, so yeah, it's, it's chaos, it's chaotic because you're everywhere with it, you know what I'm saying? Well, I really agree because I just feel like, listen, life's hard no matter yeah. what you do. And sometimes, you know, there's a, there's a quote that I really love is, you know, I think I said it on the podcast even before, but Hard choice is easy life. Easy choice is hard life. Mm -hmm. And it's gonna be hard one way or the other. So do you want the hard up front or you want it out back? Yeah. And for sure. sometimes you just gotta do those things that you just don't feel like doing at the time. Yeah. But it makes you feel better in the long run. No doubt. And you feel better physically, mentally no in the long run. So I I, yeah. I I agree with that very much. Yeah, but no doubt. just wanted to get your take on it. And the thing is too, like discipline, man, is just like discipline, once you set yourself up with saying, all right, this is what I'm gonna sacrifice. This is how I wanna set myself up. It becomes a habit, it becomes a routine. That's right. So like, you know, once, once, you, once you develop a habit and a routine, it's just, it's just your way of life. Yeah. So it, it, that one thing that you hated to do, it just becomes normal. Sometimes you look forward to it. Yeah, exactly. It just becomes normal, it's like you have to do it. Yeah. It's funny, cause like me retiring, that, that feeling of like, not doing a training camp, man, it feels like, bro, it feels so crazy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, I, I still work out and I go for my runs, but it's like, for, it doesn't have that feeling. Yeah, because it's like you were, yeah. you were coming up to a certain thing, yeah. but now there's not that thing to look yeah. forward to. And that discipline of camp, you know, you, you miss that, man. You miss that, that, that discipline. It's, it's, it's interesting. I talk to a lot of fighters that talk about how Coming up to a fight, you know, it's just miserable, right? The, the, the diet, the, the working out, the sparring, the everything working out and then, or coming up to it and then, and then fight night and you in, the, you in the dressing room, you're getting your hands wrapped and just the mental and then they're taking that ring walk. Yeah. But then the fight happens and the moment the bell's done, it's just they can't wait to do it again. Yeah. And they think to themselves the moment before it all, they're like, I'm never gonna, this is, this is terrible, I hate this. Yeah. I'm never gonna do this again. And once it's all done, it's just such a great feeling of yeah. elation mm -hmm. and, and, and the weight slipped on there, just like, I can't wait to do it again. Yeah, it's an adrenaline of like, it's an adrenaline of uh, like purpose, right? Because yeah. it's, it's hard as hell, bro. It really it's is. It's hard yeah. to, make, to stay disciplined, miss out on birthdays, miss out on events, just sacrifice yourself for that fight. And then you're putting yourself at risk Anything can happen. And um, so it's not necessary that you're scared of your opponent, but you go in there knowing that- It's serious. This is serious. Like your health is on the line. But when you come out of that, it's like, man, it's like you left everything. You, when you leave yourself like empty and you let it all out, bro, it's like, it's like, damn, that's like, it's worth it. You know what I mean? And sometimes I think about it as like, man, you know, like, yeah, you fight for money because it's prize fighting. But man, it's, it, it got, it's bigger than that. It's and, bigger than that. It's, that's like a, why, it's, it's a purpose, man. It's that's bigger why, than that. That's why the fans love you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why we're real happy to have you on here. Sure. Thank you for spending this no time doubt. with us, Gabe. I really no appreciate doubt. it. Appreciate you. Much respect. And uh, we're looking forward to a great fight. Can't wait no to doubt. hear you on the mic. Fans, tomorrow night, it's uh, Tashiro Fierro. He's fighting Zamoripa, lightweight uh, fight uh, here in Tijuana, Mexico. We're with Gabe Rosado, episode 70. This is a wrap. Match from radio with David DiMonte. We'll catch you next time. Thanks, Gabe. Thanks, bro. Yo, that sun toasting. <laughs> that sun like right here. Boom. I ain't put no sunblock on. <laughs>